My name is Ben Lesser. I am a Holocaust survivor. You all know that. I was born in Krakow, Poland in 1928 to a wonderful family. We were a family of seven. And I believe there's a picture we can show you. Okay. There is my family, my father, my mother, my little brother, Tuli, my sister, Goldie, and my oldest brother, Morris. Now, none of these people that you see in this photograph survived the war. Every one of them were slaughtered by the Nazis. My sister, Goldie, I lived in Krakow with my sister Goldie. She stayed with her grandparents in Munkac, Hungary. Um, when the war broke out, she was visiting her grandparents, my mother's side of the family, and she was kind of stuck there. So we were all in Krakow, except my sister Goldie. Now, None of these people survived, but my sister Lola, that we're here, you see the picture of me with Lola. She and I were the only survivors out of a family of seven. We lived in a beautiful building, an apartment house in Krakow, Poland, on a major street. This was the building. And the three windows on my left side of the street level were part of our apartment. And the apartment went all the way back into the yard. Um, the last window that you see there, the third window was my bedroom. One early in the morning, in 1939, when the war broke out, uh, we saw the, the whole building started to shake and rattle. So I ran to the window to see what's going on. And I saw tanks were rolling down the street. And following the tanks, there were half tracks. And soldiers, Wehrmacht, were on top of the half track. And every few steps, a soldier would jump out, get on the sidewalk, and this is how they occupied the city. Following the uh, half-tracks, they were the Wehrmacht, and it was quite impressionable for a 10 and a half year old. That was my age at the time, looking out and seeing these, um, Wehrmacht with their beautiful black boots and their goose steps. It was very impressionable, but we didn't know what to expect. I mean, if my parents knew something, they didn't tell us kids. But I have a feeling my parents knew because Kristallnacht, which by the way, today is the... Um, anniversary of Kristallnacht. It was yesterday and today, two days. And I'm sure that you know all about Kristallnacht. If not, then ask your teachers to please tell you about it. Um, it's quite, um, it would take a long time for me to go into that. But right now, I'm sure that my parents knew something because many of the Jewish people, especially the Polish Jews, were deported back to Poland. And I'm sure that my father and mother must have met some people and they found out. But we found out what Kristallnacht was all about. But 
we had no idea what is really coming. And on the ver fifth day after occupation of Krakow, we found out Nazi brutality, what it really was. Early morning at 5 a.m., a truck pulled up to this gate and they started to bang on the gate. And when the super came out asking what's going on, all they wanted to know where the Jewish people lived. And he was quick to oblige. He told them that we lived on this side and the other side of the gate was another Jewish family. So they came and broke down the door, pistol whipping all of us, we were still in bed, and they had open sex and they were yelling at us to throw in all our valuables, money, gold, jewelry, uh, anything of value. And at the same time, they were beating up my father to open up the safe. Now the other side of the, of the entrance was another family, was a young mother and father, and they had two daughters uh, about my age, because I remember after school we would play in the yard, and they, the mother gave birth to, to a little um, young boy. Um, the baby was only about two or three months old. And we, we hear this terrible screaming going on from that apartment. So my sister Lola and I ran out from the kitchen door and we ran into their apartment through their kitchen and this is what we saw. We saw this monster was holding the baby by its legs and swinging it and telling the parents to make him shut up. Of course, the parents were screaming, our baby, our baby, don't hurt our baby. And we could see this monster with a big smile and he was enjoying what he was doing, and he smashes the baby's head into the doorpost, killing it instantly. You can imagine the parents and even us, my sister and I, jumped on this monster. But the, the other, his bodies came in running from our apartment. They came running in, and they saw what was going on. They said, come on, Hans, let's go. And they, picked, they, they had all the, the stuff that they got from our apartment, from their apartment, they threw it in the truck and they took off. That was on the fifth day after occupation of Krakow. So we had a good idea of what's about to come, but no one really, knew to what extent the Nazis will take it. My father had a business, two businesses. He had a wine and syrup business on the same street in Krakow. And he also had the chocolate factory somewhere else. And he was the first man to make chocolate covered wafers like Kit Kat. Um, they were make, made like little animals, like rabbits, bears, and the tin foil on it. Um, anyway, he goes to his business and the wine and syrup business, and there were guard stations, and they chased them away. They said, confiscate it. They wouldn't even let him go and take his briefcase. Then he went to the other business, the chocolate factory, and also there were guard stations at the, at the gate and they chased them away. So you can imagine a man works all his life to build up a little business to feed the family. And just like that, it's taken away. But this was just the beginning. 
Of course, new ordinances came out. We all had to wear Star of David's. We all had to wear Star of David's. And Jewish people could no longer work at certain places. And they had to report to go to work for, the, for cleaning the streets in Krakow. And don't ask. They were being beaten up every time. And some of the men who had beards, they cut their beard in, in, in funny shapes. And they were making big junk jokes out of this. This was going on for a while and new ordinances came in. We al they also had a curfew from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Jewish people could not go out of the house. And if they happened to go outside and they found them during, during the hours where they're not supposed to be out on the street, there was only one punishment for the Jewish people. There were no, there were no judges, no juries. They simply shot you. If you disobeyed any of the ordinances, they simply shot you on the street, on the spot. And in fact, it was, was unbelievable at the time, but I'm not going to this was going on for a while, and then after a while, a new ordinance came in, said Jewish people could no longer uh, live in Krakow. But they gave us a choice. They had made a ghetto, and they said, okay, if you want to stay in Krakow, you can go inside the ghetto. The choice was given that we can move to a neighboring little town out of the city. So my sister Lola was a beautiful girl. She was, must have been about 15 at the time or 15 and a half. And she had a young man who was her suitor. He fell in love with her. So he comes to my father. He says, Mr. Lesser, you know how I feel about Lola. Someday I'd love to marry her. Do me a favor. I will take care of everything, but come to the same communities that my family is moving. The name of the town was called Nyepalamitsa. So my father gave him the choice to go to a ghetto or to go to the small community, he obviously agreed to go to the small community. Michael helped us pack and uh, he hired a wagon with a horse and buggy and a driver and he helped us load. Now we couldn't take any furniture, but we can only take whatever we can lift up ourselves. So we, we had at that point, we found out that my father had 1,000 American dollars that he saved up for a rainy day. He took that money and he pasted it into a religious book and he put it in a sack full of other books. We had two sacks full of, of uh, literature of Jewish literature and he put it in there and we left. On the way, as soon as we went out of the city of Krakow, we were being stopped by the Nazis. Halt! And two husky Nazis jump on the wagon and all they wanted was Jewish literature. You have any books? And obviously they saw the two sacks full of books they picked them up and heaved it on the mountain of books. Everyone who had to leave, who did not go into the ghetto, had to use this road to leave the city. So they waited there and they took all these books and they were going to have a bonfire after everybody left. So my sister Lola spoke a beautiful German. And she walks up to this 
uh, soldier and she says to him, look, my father is a writer. He wrote his autobiography. Let him keep this one book. But she spoke a beautiful German. Maybe he liked the way she spoke. He says, okay, I'll give you five minutes if you can find it. Now you can imagine the whole family started to climb on the books. All these books looked alike. They were either brown or black, leather bound. And obviously you keep sliding down after five minutes. They chased us away without the book. We couldn't find it. And my father is going to a different community without a penny. How is he going to feed a family of six? Remember, we were a family of seven. But my sister Goldie was in Munkach, Hungary. But we were only six there in, the, in the, this wagon. And you couldn't recognize my father. My future brother-in-law, Michael, rented a house in Nepalomitsa, in that community. And when we arrived to that community, this is the farmhouse that you see that he rented. And by the way, all these pictures that you see are pictures that my sister made out of memory. She made these pictures in 1950, simply out of memory. And this looks almost like, like the house that we lived in. The farmer lived on one side and we lived on the other side. And between the two apartments, there was an oven where you can bake your own bread. And when we arrived there, and my future brother-in-law heard what happened to my father, so they took everything away, he brought him a sack full of flour, a hundred pounds of flour, figuring he'll be able to bake breads to feed the family. But when my father saw the flour, his face lit up. He was so happy and he took the flour and he did not bake bread, but instead he baked pretzels. Why pretzels? All you need for pretzels is flour, water, and salt. And those ingredients he had. Then he took the pretzels out to the neighboring bars and he offered it for sale. It was a novelty, I guess, and they bought it. They kept buying the pretzels. Now he was able to bake a bread for the family to eat. And before he even knew it, he became a little baker in the whole community. He baked mandel bread, he baked um, uh, cookies, um, breads, hollies, he, all kind of baked goods and the neighborhood was buying from him. And my sister Lola marries Michael and they had the wedding and this is the wedding party that was in the yard. This was not allowed. They did not, the Nazis did not allow us to gather more than three people in one place. Either it's a family, but if it's not a family, more than three people couldn't be together. But they did it anyway in the backyard. And you see Michael, my, my brother, my future brother-in-law, my sister Lola. This picture is of me. I'm right here, the third person, that's me. This is my little brother, Tully, and my mother. Uh, he is leaning on my mother. Now, the strange thing is, out of all the people that you see, only three of us survived. Michael, Lola, and I. Everyone else was slaughtered. Nobody survived the war.
when Michael and Lola moved into a duplex, one side of the duplex lived the owner who happened to be the mayor of that community. And Michael and, Gail, Michael and Lola lived on the other side. Um, one day the mayor comes home and he says, Michael, Lola, save yourselves. We heard rumors that there might be a raid tonight or tomorrow night against the Jewish people. When Michael heard that, he rented, he went out and he hired a wagon, a, a, the horse and buggy with the driver. In the middle of the night, we snuck out with whatever we could carry. We put it on the wagon and we left that town. Now it's a good thing that we, we did leave because that night there was a raid and practically thousands of Jewish people were gathered up in trucks in the whole area and they were taken to the forest and they were given, the men were given shovels. They had to dig their own graves and then everybody else was shot. Everyone was shot. Now we found this out after the war when we went back to that town. How did we find this out? There were farmers who used to go to the forest to pick berries and they picked mushrooms. And then they would take it in the market and sell it. And they had to go there early in the morning and they saw these trucks come with all the Jewish people and they saw what was going on. They were hiding behind trees. And after the war, we found out what happened to all the Jewish people. Now we had to, when we left with the horse and wagon, with the horse and buggy, we only can go to one place. The nearest place was a town, a city called Bochnia. Bochnia had a ghetto. That meant that we had to go inside the ghetto. Well, Bochnia had also a very bad reputation. What happened there? Every once in a while, three or four dump trucks would come into the ghetto and the Nazis would go from house to house, pull out the children from their beds and throw them into these trucks. You can imagine the parents were screaming for the children. The children were screaming for the parents. And as they filled up three or four dump trucks, they would pull out. And as they pull out of the ghetto, the parents were running behind these trucks and screaming for their children. But these cultured Nazis, had machine guns at the end of each truck. And as the parents were running behind, they were mowing down the parents running behind the children. Now, we heard that story and every, everybody knew, all the Jewish people knew what was going on in Bachnian ghetto, but we had no choice. We had to go there and it's a good thing we left Nepalomitsa because if we wouldn't have left, we would have been killed. Excuse me. When we came into the ghetto, um, the wagon was able to go inside. Uh, the driver had to leave his IDs with the guards, and when the driver came out, they, they let him out. But we Jewish people had to be in the ghetto. And in the ghetto, uh, they had Jewish policemen. The Jewish policemen didn't have any weapons. All they had was a baton. And uh, their job was to keep to keep um, order inside the ghetto. 
Uh, if the Nazis needed some people to come out of the ghetto to dig ditches or do some work, they would ask them to bring out these people. So this was their job. But they, some of these, uh, some of these uh, poli Jewish policemen, they were called, all of them were called kapos, but some of them were good and others were not so good. And Michael found a friend who he went to school with who happened to be a policeman, a Jewish policeman. He says, Michael, what are you doing here? So he is telling him a story. And this policeman says, don't worry, we'll find you a place inside the ghetto, but you and your parents have to go to one place and the lessers, um, my father, my mother, myself, my little brother, they took us to another place. So to give you an idea of what ghetto living was life, like, like, they put us into a room with eight other people. Now we were 12. There were no beds, only straw on the floor, and there were blankets on top of the straw. There were blankets hanging on the wall, separating each family. And they had an old table, boxes for chairs, um, they, they had a little stove, and with all this old furniture, it was strange that they had this one armoire where you hang your clothing that would look nice. It looked like it was a beautiful piece. But I, I didn't pay attention. While I was in the ghetto, everyone had to work. So my little brother, obviously didn't work, but I was about 12 and a half at the time, and I worked in a uniform factory sewing on buttons. That was my job. If you didn't work, they didn't feed you. And we were there a long time in the ghetto. I forget how long, because time didn't mean anything to me. Um, one day, Farber, this Jewish policeman who happened to be a friend of Michael, tells Michael, I understand there'll be a raid tonight or tomorrow night, save yourselves. Well, ever since those trucks would come in and pick out the children out of their beds and take them away, every house in every apartment had a hiding place. The hiding place was called a bunker. That's when I found that our bunker was in this beautiful piece of furniture. You opened up the door, you pushed apart the clothing, the back panel would slide open, there was a hole in the wall, and 12 people could crawl into through that hall, hole and stand between two buildings. The outside of the buildings were connected, lucky for us, so they couldn't see us, but the roof was open and it was snowing, it was cold, and the 12 of us were standing there all night and we heard shooting, we heard dogs barking, screaming, you can't imagine all the crying and screaming we heard. We heard that the dogs were turn, tearing apart our neighbors who, who were caught. And then after morning, in the morning, it got a little quiet and we decided we'll check and go out. That's when my, my, That's how we all went out through the gate and we came outside. When we came outside, we couldn't believe what our eyes have seen. Never in my life have I seen anything like this. 
people laying on the ground, torn apart by dogs, mothers holding their babies dead, and people going around in push carts, picking up these bodies and pieces of bodies, piling it on the push carts, and then they took them to the um, uh, to the town square, to Bochnia town, to the ghetto square, and they piled them up like cords of wood, and these cultured people came with gas cans, and they were pouring gasoline over them, and they started the bonfire, a human, a human bonfire in the middle of Bochnia ghetto. I knew that my sister Lola and her husband and fa his family also had a hiding place. Their hiding place was a doghouse. You heard right, a doghouse. You pulled the floor up from the doghouse, there was a stepladder, and seven people can go down into that ladder, down the ladder, and they had provisions, they had food, they had bedding, everything ready for them. And I went there to see my sister, what happened to them. When I went there, I saw all the bodies and, and, and I saw my sister and I asked, what happened? Anyway, then we found out what happened. Before they went into the doghouse, another policeman, a Jewish couple, comes up with his mother and his sister. And he says to Michael, Michael, I know about your doghouse hiding place. Unless you take my mother and my sister with you to hide there, I'm going to tell the authorities. Well, when that happened, they had no choice. They had to take them. And there was only room for seven. Now they were nine. So Lola and Michael walked away. Now this is a long story what happened. They walked away. They survived, but the rest of the family were all shot. And, and then Michael knew, according to the Jewish religion, you're supposed to bury your family, your loved ones, within 12 or 24 hours. Um, he went out and he found a wheelbarrow. He took his family, put him on the wheelbarrow, took him up to the cemetery. In Bochnia Ghetto, they had a cemetery. And there they found the shovel and they dug out the grave, they put the family in. So to tell you the story, what happened with like Michael and Lola uh, will take too long of a time and I don't know how much time I have. Um, how much time do I have left? Could someone tell me? Um. I'm not sure. Uh, Mark or Ludwig, um, I, they said all the time you need, Ben. That's what they're texting really? me. But yeah. let's get, let's get into when, yes. uh, when you be, be, when in, before Auschwitz. Okay. All right. So how we got out of the ghetto, somehow my family, and Lola and Michael got out of the ghetto. That's a story in itself and it would take me very long. But all I can tell you is Michael found a truck driver who was hauling coal and a uh, coal and he asked them would he make his truck into a double decker where there's coal on top and between the coal and the chassis, 10 people could fit there. And he did, he found this truck and, and the truck driver took me and my little brother, 
first with another eight people. There were 10 of us like sardines under the coal. And the truck took us to the um, border of Czechoslovakia and Poland because we wanted to run away from Poland, run to Hungary because Hungary was still a free country. This was in 1943. And we got into the truck, they closed it up. And as we left Bochnia, about an hour out of Bochnia, we're being stopped, halt. And we can see through the cracks that there soldiers with with rifles we figured uh oh somebody turned us in and the truck stopped and they're talking to the driver we couldn't hear what they're saying and then all of a sudden the truck is moving again and so we felt good they're letting us go they don't know about us but when we looked through the cracks, we saw a driver. One soldier was standing on the step next to the cab, driving cab, next to the driver. On one side, there was another soldier on the other side. And now soldiers were walking on top of the coal and the truck is driving. So we figured, uh oh, they're taking us to it cemetery or to a forest they're going to shoot all of us kill us this was for about one hour they were riding and while they were on top of the coal some of the coal dust was coming down and my little brother was about to sneeze so i held his mouth keeping him quiet and then the truck stops and all of a sudden the soldiers come down and they say, Danke schön, Danke schön. They just hitchhike. But then meanwhile, <laughs> we almost passed out. All they did is hitchhike. And the driver took us to the forest. Uh, it was nighttime already. And he unloaded the coal and he told us all to come out. And we came out and he told us to walk up about 300 yards there is a tool shed. Inside the tool shed, there is the smuggler. The smuggler happened to be a forest ranger who is also, he will smuggle us across the border. And we went there, it was nighttime. We came to this tool shed, we opened it up. Sure enough, he was there waiting for us. And he then took us to his house which was maybe one or two kilometers away. We had to walk and we walked and we arrived there. We were able to wash up a little bit because we were all full of dust, cold dust. And we ate a little something they made up for us. And at three o'clock in the morning, we had to cross the border. Why at three? The guards who were on top of the line there walking back and forth with dogs would go down the hill at three o'clock and they would meet the fresh guards. They would exchange times. And during that period, there was a little ceremony. And by the time the fresh guards came up, we had about five to 10 minutes during that time we had to cross the border and it was exactly three. We were all laying on the ground and the guards started to march down with their dogs. And after they were down the hill, the smuggler went, we, we all went up and the smuggler picked up the barbed wire. We crossed the barbed wire and he told us that on the other side of the barbed wire, there is a big drop on the mountain. So he says, be very quiet, just slide down, holding each other. Because if you make noise, they're gonna hear you, they're gonna come back and they're gonna arrest you. 
So this is what we did. We sat down on the other side is a big mountain ravine and we started to slide. I'm holding my little brother and we're sliding down. It was so pitch black, you couldn't see your hand in front of you that night, it was so dark. And when we hit a plateau, I asked my brother, are you okay? He says, yes. And a minute he said, yes, somebody taps me on my shoulder and I almost jump out of my skin. Who in the world is out in the middle of the wilderness out here? I got so scared and he says, Bainish? He called me Bainish, which is Yiddish. A Jewish name, only my mother and father would call me by that name. Everybody else called me Ben or Benek. Um, so he says, I'm your uncle Bela, your, your mother's brother. How did you know where to find me? So he told us that Lola and Michael went across the same route and they told him where to find us and he was waiting for us. Anyway, he smuggled us through, through Hungary. We had to go through another border and that wasn't so simple, but it's a long story. And once we were in Hungary, we boarded a wagon with the driver and he took us to a small town where there was a train station. We boarded the train and the train took us to Budapest. In Budapest, we met up with my sister and Michael. And of course, they fed us and we washed up and cleaned up. But the same more, the next morning, we had to leave to go to Munkaj, where my older sister is and where my grandparents are, my uncles and aunts and cousins whole family from my mother's side lived in Munkaj. So this is what we did. And when we arrived to Munkaj, of course, my sister Goldie, uh, we embraced and the whole family. My un one of my uncles invited me to stay with my little brother together in his house. Uh, he was a very wealthy man. He had a store where you sell yardage goods for suits and dresses. And then he also, besides that, he had, um, the house was on top of the store, beautiful home. So I told, everybody in Munkaj, what's happening in Poland. The Nazis are killing us, they're putting us in camps, all of that. So nobody believed us. Nobody believed us. But those people who did believe said, this will never, never happen in Hungary, because Hungary is an ally of Germany. Why would Germany siphon off soldiers from the front to occupy a friendly country. It didn't make sense and it didn't make sense. I agree. But my uncle believed me. And I told my uncle, I says, you know, if the Nazis should ever come in here, they'll take everything away, your store and all your valuables. It would be nice if you had something small that we can put in our pocket or hide it in our clothing like diamonds. He listened to me. And one day he comes home with boxes of shoes, a pair of black shoes for every member of the family. And he told us that inside the heels of the shoes, there are diamonds use it only in a life-threatening situation where you can save your life. Know that you have diamonds in your heels of the shoes. And one day, sure, in March of 1944, the Nazis just marched right into Hungary like they were invited guests. 
when they came into Hungary, they knew every Jewish person where they live. They knew their ages, their businesses. Everyone was, how did they know? They didn't have computers in those days. IBM had punch cards. And they sold these punch cards to anyone who wants to buy it. And IBM doesn't deny it. They, uh, they, they tell, tell us that they sold these punch cards to the Nazis. They didn't know for what purpose they're going to use it. So they sold it. Now they had, they knew exactly where everyone lived. Now the question is, why did Hitler come into Hungary? It didn't make sense. He was losing the war in March of 1943. He knew, 19, yeah, 1943, he knew that he is losing the war. 750,000 Jewish inhabitants in Hungary. To Hitler, to kill Jews and pilfer their wealth was more important at that point than winning the war. And within two months, in April, beginning of May, the end of April, beginning of May, was already transferring, transporting people full of trains loads of, of Jewish people from Hungary to death camps. This is what they told us. You will all be relocated to Germany. Germany needs workers, and we will take care of all the children and the older people. Children will go to school, older people will be taken care of, young people will be working, men and women will be working. And bring along with you all of your valuables that you can carry. Anything you can't carry, leave it there and anyone found hiding will be shot. Well, people believed it because they, no one believed what really happened. This is something nobody knew. And people were going with their bundles and were going and were there marching us to the train 82 cattle car, and before we, they told us to go in the cattle car, I see two men with a stretcher walking up and they put down the stretcher. On the stretcher, there was a woman beaten up, black and blue, I couldn't, and I look, I, it's my sister Goldie. My beautiful sister Goldie you couldn't recognize her face was all bloodied, black and blue. I said, Goldie, what happened to you? She says she tried to escape. She went as far as the railroad station and a Hungarian gendarme recognized her because he went to school with her and he turned her into the Gestapo. They beat her to a pulp, and now they tell us to get into the cattle wagon. 80 in one wagon. Now, 80 into a wagon wouldn't be so bad if we didn't have all these bundles and valises, but everyone had a bundle. It got so tight that if you wanted to sit down, somebody else had to stand up. And they pushed us in there. And now they had two buckets of water in the corner. And after the water was gone, there were no uh, other facilities, no toilets. 
So people were using those buckets as toilets. And after a while, they filled up those buckets. One day, two days, they filled up. Now the buckets were sloshing over and all the human waste was on the floor of the cattle wagon. Now we were happy that we had bundles because we can sit on top of the bundles instead of sitting. And, but the, 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 the condition inside the cattle wagon is, is hard to describe. People were screaming, yelling, old people, sick people, babies, infants, pregnant women screaming, yelling, they didn't, some of them didn't have, some of us had food and others did not have food. We didn't have water. And don't ask, that with, with all the smell and it was something terrible. People were dying inside, some of the weaker people were dying. One day, two days, after three days, it was nighttime. We arrive someplace and it says Oshwienczym. Oshwienczym is Polish for Auschwitz. Nobody heard of an Auschwitz before. We didn't know where it was, but we figured we're still in Poland. Oshwienczym sounds Polish. The train didn't stop there, but it kept going for another two kilometers. And then it stopped and it was standing in a place and we saw a gate. On top of the gate, it said, Arbeit macht frei. Well, that made a lot of sense to us. It's a labor camp. Arbeit macht frei, this is the gate we saw. It's a labor camp, it made sense. But the train only stayed there one or two hours and then it started to pull away from there and was now pulling away for another two or three kilometers and it stopped and the doors opened up and all hell broke loose. The people we see, SS men, Gestapo, and they're screaming, Raus, Raus, Schnell, Schnell. And, and there were people in striped clothes, inmates, yelling in all different languages, leave all your belongings there. Don't pick up anything. Walk out. Women and children to the right, men to the left. And my sister Goldie and my little brother Tuli went to the right. I went to the left with my uncle and his son. Um, with the man, I was only 15 and a half. I wasn't a man and I wasn't a child either. Along, so I didn't know which way to go, but I decided to go with the man because I figured if this is a labor camp, they want you to labor, they want you to work. And if I work, they'll feed me better. But that's all, it was nighttime. We couldn't see a thing. We saw five or six chimneys and flames shooting out of these chimneys and ashes were spewing all over the place. Every time we make the step, we left a footprint in the ashes just like you would, just like you would in, in snow. We didn't know what those ashes are, but the man ahead of me we're saying, oh, those flames, those must be smelting factories. This is probably where we will be working. Who knew? We didn't know what this was. Of course, later we found out those were crematoriums. They were burning our, our, our families, our brothers and sisters, those ashes were part of them, they're falling all over the place. We didn't know that. And they're marching us forward and I see a man, like a doctor, one of the doctor with white frock, 
he had white gloves and he goes with his index finger, right, left, right, left, right, left. And every once in a while, he would ask a question of somebody. So this young man ahead of us uh, was asked, kannst du fünf kilometers laufen? Can you run five kilometers? Or would you rather go by truck? And he said that he had a bad knee. He would rather go by truck. Poor guy not realizing that meant certain death. They send them to the right. But who knew? A doctor is asking you a question. But to me, it didn't make sense. Why would he ask such a question? I can see barracks. We are already in a labor camp. We finally got here. Why would they uh, take us five kilometers away? It didn't make sense. I figured he's trying to test us to see if you're strong enough to work. So I spoke German and my uncle and my cousin, I told them, go behind me and I, I will go first. And I came in front of this doctor and before he had the chance to say a word, I said, stretch myself out. And I said, 18 Jahre alt, gesund und arbeitsfähig. And he, he looks at me and he says, kannst du fünf kilometers laufen? I says, jawohl. And he sent me to the left, my uncle, went to the left too, and my, his son also went to the left. And then, then all of us are being led to a, we don't know where, but to a building, it was a brick building and they let us inside and it was a big room and they ordered everybody to get on the rest. Get on the rest, get out of your shoes, and walk over to those barbers that were inmates holding um, uh, 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 holding, you know, um, uh, cutting, uh, hair cutting uh, machines, little machines. And they were, and then they told everybody to get undressed. Anyway, I got undressed, my uncle gets undressed. Remember, in our shoes, we have diamonds in our heels. I wasn't gonna leave those diamonds. So I got undressed and I left my shoes on. My uncle who gave me those diamonds in the shoes, he got out of the shoes. His son got also out of the shoes because they said, get out of the shoes, just leave everything there, walk over to those barbers. And I walk over to the barbers, they cut my hair all over my body, and then they didn't say anything about my shoes. Then they sent me into the a big room and there was a, a bathhouse. And once they filled up the room, they closed the door when they closed the door, some men started to scream. I couldn't figure out why. I guess some of them knew that the spigots in the gas chambers, gas comes out to kill. And they, so they started to scream. But the minute water started coming out, it got quiet. And everybody took a shower. Then we had to go to a blow, they blew out all the water off of us and they put DDT all over our body and they sent us to a place where they had uh, uniforms, the stripe uniforms, and they handed me the uniform and no one said anything about my shoes. I still had my shoes on. So now uh, they gave us shoes that they were wooden soles with canvas on top. So I got into those shoes and I put my black shoes under my jacket. And when we walked out of there, and by the way, 
they also gave us a little round discs with a number. My number was 41212. That was my number. Um, and we had to wear this number all the time, this little disc on the string. We had to wear this all the time. And they march us out. Now they march us, it's still dark, and they march us to a barrack. The Stuben Elteste comes out from the barrack and he speaks to us in a broken German. And I could tell in his accents that he is from Poland. He's Polish. And he says, ha, you Hungarian Jews, you think you're here on vacation? Think again. You see those chimneys, those ashes? Those are your mothers, your fathers, your brothers, and your sisters. And if you don't behave and do exactly what you told, this is exactly what you're going to wind up, is ashes. We couldn't believe what he just said. This is the 20th century. These are educated, cultured people. You mean they, they're, they're burning my, 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 my sister, my little brother, ashes? We couldn't believe that. But then he ordered us to go into the barrack and we had to go to pick a bunk. My uncle, cousin and I picked the upper bunk. We figured it's gonna be better sleeping on top. And we were so tired, we simply fell asleep. All three of us fell asleep. And after an hour, my cousin punches me, he starts to wake me up, wake up and wake up. I says, what's going on? He says, listen. And I hear a humming or a chanting or a singing. I don't know what it is. And then he says, look, one side of the barrack had boards missing in the wall. And we see an orange hue, like flames. Now, I spoke Polish because I'm from Krakow, Poland. But I came with the Hungarian Jews. And I knew the Stuben eldest that was from Poland. So I walk up to him and I says, tell me something. What do I see on this, this, this orange hue? And what do I hear? He says, ha, huh, you Hungarian Jews, you know nothing. He says, six months before Hungary was occupied by the Nazis, they made us dig ditches here as fire pits for the influx of the Hungarian Jews. They built in other crematorium, in another gas chamber, just so that they can put in those Hungarian Jews. These train from Hungary were coming in fast and furious, lined up one after another, and they had to kill people. And they, he told me they had to kill almost 5,000 or 5,500 a day. And he tells me about the gas chambers. Is that it takes a half an hour to kill a person in the gas chambers. But the Nazis could not afford to give a half an hour to kill a person because the trains were coming in with all the other people. So they watched in the window, and as soon as they saw most of the people were laying on the floor, they had opened the door, have the gas go out, wait for 10 minutes, and have the Sonderkommando come in and pull out the people from there. They were still half alive, but they were 
knocked out. And they had to pull out their gold teeth. They had to cut their hair and check the body to see if there's anything hidden in the body. Then they would put four or five people on a gurney, put rope around it, and take it to the crematorium. But that process was too slow. So now they had dump trucks, and they would throw those half dead people on the dump trucks. And, and then I asked them, but what, what is that sound that we hear? He said, Jechi, huh? Children? They couldn't be bothered with infants and children. They had no gold teeth. They had no hair. They threw the live children on top of the half dead bodies on these dump trucks. And now they were taking them to the fire pits and dumping them in there in the fire pits. And that's the the screamings that they hear, these little babies alive, throwing into the fire pits. I couldn't believe what I just heard. Anyway, what I went through in Auschwitz for two weeks will take too long to tell the story. You couldn't believe they didn't. We didn't work. They had it in a bar Had us in a bar in that barrack, and near the fire pits, and we can hear all the screaming all the time, day and night. And then morning and evening, we had to come out naked, and the SS would check us out and see if we're healthy enough to work. And if you're not healthy, if you could not stand in, 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 in like a soldier solid in one place for at least an hour, morning and hour in the evening, they would simply shoot you. They would kill you, pull you out or beat you to death. They had a game they used to play. Would you believe that? Is that they would tell us, Mütze Abnehmen. They took off the cap and we had to hit the bottom of our legs with the cap. And if they heard one sound, it was okay. But if somebody hit later, they wanted to know who it was. And if they found out who it was, they would pull him out and kill him in front of everybody. I mean, you can't believe that a human person, a educated human person could be such sadists, such killers, millions of people, killing people, hundreds of thousands, unbelievable. My dear friends, you're German. I have no bad feeling against you for whatever your grandparents or great grandparents might have done. I have no bad feeling, but I want you to know what was going on. The world has to know. We can't keep silent. There are only a few of us Holocaust survivors who can still speak around. So we're telling you, we're telling you what, what, how hate, what hate can cause. And from that place, after two weeks, they put us in dump trucks and they took us into a labor camp called Dernhau. Dernhau was a rock quarry. And every day we would go to the rock quarry and as they dynamited the mountain and the boulders were coming down, it was our job with sledgehammers to break 
the big boulders into manageable pieces, throw in those pieces into mining, uh, mining carts, uh, little wagons on wheels and roll it down the track and down the hill there was grinding machines and they made it into gravel and then we had to then we had to push up the we had to push the the mining carts back uphill and do the pounding on these boulders it was back breaking work and i figured that my cousin my uncle could never live through it that hard work so i took the diamonds from my shoes and i i gave it to the kitchen chef he should give my uncle a job in the kitchen and he took the diamonds and he came back for more and more and finally he took all the diamonds that i had and but my uncle had a good job in the kitchen and every day when we came back from work we would come into the camp and they would line us up and they would count us in rows of fires they would count us and as as they're counting after counting they usually dismiss us and we go take our rations and then we go in the barrack and we shower or go to go to sleep or what but this time no they keep counting and counting and the commandant comes down with his fräulein and he says to us i'm going to show the schweinhunds a lesson they'll never forget what happened three of the inmates escaped and because of this he orders every tenth person in line to be pulled out to receive 25 lashes and as they're pulling out every tenth person i can see my uncle who was in front of me was number 10. i switch him i push him behind me and i took his place and sure enough, they took all us number 10 in the middle of the yard and they brought out two bundles of hardwood stakes, one by one. They brought out the hardwood stakes and they brought out a sawhorse. This is a sawhorse. They brought out a sawhorse and they line us up and this is what they order us to do bend over the sawhose but your you can only tiptoe your heels cannot touch the ground tiptoe bent over the sawhorse but your stomach cannot touch the two by four on top one man would push pull your trousers real tight and the other man was hitting you and you have to count out loud if you miscount you start from one again and if your heel touches the ground you start from one again if your stomach touches the two by four you start from one again it was impossible i was number four the first man goes up and of course his stomach touches his heel touches he starts again and again miscounts and again and again finally he falls down as he falls down the commandant was bobs over pulls out his revolver he says get up he couldn't he shoots him right in the temple when he shoots him his girlfriend his fräulein walks over to him and gives him a hug and a kiss like he just performed some kind of heroic act number two goes up the same thing number two falls down the commandant goes over shoots him two dead bodies number three goes up 
he couldn't make it either. His heel had, and he, it's terrible. And every time they hit him, you can see blood coming through the trousers. And they, he was a younger man, so he screams, please have mercy on me, don't kill me. So the commandant says, then get up and come over here and face me. The poor guy gets up, makes four or five steps, and his knees gave out on him, and he fell. The minute he fell, he shoots him. He has three bodies, and I, Ben Lesser, is number four. I'm next in line. Well, what can I tell you? I, I walked up to this sawhorse. I remember saying something to myself, Ben, if you want to live in other half hour, better do exactly what you're told. So I walk over, I tiptoe, I bend over the two by four without touching the two by four. One man is pulling my trousers real tight, the other one starts to hit, and I start to count. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, six, seven. Finally, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, I made it. You could hear a pin drop in the camp because nobody believed that anyone could survive this. When I did, the man who was pulling my trousers tight tells me, go over and thank the commandant. So I stand up and I walk over, blood is running down my trousers, and I salute him and I say, Danke schön, Herr Commandant. When he hears that, he puts his hands on my collar. He twists me around, facing the number tens. And he says, now I told you it could be done. If you do it like this, Junge, you have nothing to worry about. While this is going on, there is a commotion at the gate. They caught those three inmates and they were pulling them in, black and blue, bloodied. You couldn't recognize any of them. When the commandant saw that, just like a child gets sick of a toy, he told all of us number 10 to go back in line. And he instructed his henchmen to bring down a portable gallow. He brought down a gallow and we all had to watch while these three men were being hung one by one. It was only room for one person at a time. I remember the third person, person was a younger man and he, when they put the noose around his neck, he started to scream out a prayer. There is a prayer. It's only nine words. And when the minute they heard it, they kicked the stool out from under him and they wouldn't let him complete this prayer. But what can I tell you? It's been weeks that I could not lay on my back. I was laying on my stomach at night. One night we hear cannon fire. The front was closing in. And that morning when we reported to go to work, they said no one is going to work. The camp is being evacuated. Line up in rows of fives, so they lined us up and they started to march us out. My uncle was already in the kitchen. We never saw him again. He did not survive. I don't know what happened to him. We never saw him again. Now we started to march out. My cousin and I, that's called the death march. Why did they call it the death march? Because if you could not keep up pace, they simply shot you. And all day long you hear pop, pop, pop. You were shooting people. One week, 
two weeks. After two weeks, both of our shoes fell apart. And now there was still snow on the ground. So we were walking with this, on the snow fast. We had to keep our pace because if we slow up, they're going to kill us. For another week, my, own, my cousin got very sick and I, I dragged them along for another week and we arrived to Buchenwald. And when we arrived to Buchenwald, they counted us. They told us to go into this barrack where they fed us and we slept there. And we also went to a bed. They had a bed house there. We took a shower. And after, the sh and after sleeping next morning, we had to be back on the same place because they said, Buchenwald is also being evacuated. I'll tell you the story later about this, I think was me and the bad house in Buchenwald. Must have been taken by an SS, this picture. But anyway, um, next morning we lined up again and they march us out. We had fresh clothes. And, and good good wooden sole shoes. And we walk, they walk us out about 300 yards and we see a line of cattle cars. And they line us up, 82 cattle car, and line us up and they told us to go in. Now I tell my cousin, please, I'll push you in, but find a spot near a wall so that we can rest our back against the wall. Because I remember going in the wagon to Auschwitz and I was in people all around it. it was terrible. And he found a good spot against the wall and we found, and they closed the door. An hour later, they opened the door and they threw in 80 breads, a loaf of bread for each person. You can picture this. Those people who were next to the door were grabbing four or five breads. And those of us who were against the wall had nothing. And I and my cousin had nothing. And we, we don't know where we're going. So I started to climb over the sitting inmates to get to the door to try and wrestle out the bread from somebody. And I came there. On the way there, somebody had a pocket knife and he stabs me. I feel a stab right here. Um, I feel it to this day, there is still a mark, but the stab was in the middle of my throat. I was so skinny, but now that I filled up, it's over here. Um, I couldn't let go. I had to get a bread. So I, this man had several breads and I pulled one bread out he punches me. I put it in my pocket and I go back to my cousin. He says, Ben, what's happening? You're, you're bleeding. I put my finger here and went right through the tongue. As a hole was right through the tongue. It was a miracle how I survived. But that one breath that I had, I rationed it for my cousin and I, the size of a half an egg for him every night, the middle of the night, because if somebody saw that we had bread, they would kill us for it. <clears throat> so I gave him, and imagine for two weeks, I kept giving each of us a little piece of bread. And after two weeks, it ran out. The train was going three weeks, 3,000 people in the train left from Buchenwald and we arrived to finally to Dachau after three weeks and only 18 people walked out of the train and going into the camp of Dachau. They told us anyone who can walk out, walk over the tracks into the camp and only 18 of us walked out from 3,000. And today I'm the only survivor left. And yeah. If, um, if I could interrupt real quick, I, um, you know, 
the students are uh, in an area around Namoring, and that train stopped in Namoring. So you, I want to make sure that you mention that to the students so they know. I found out after the war. I didn't know then that we we were in Namoring, so they took out hundreds of people from the train and they shot them and they buried them there in the mass grave. I had no idea about this because we, we didn't know, but we found this out recently from, from some of your people who lived there. Uh, but anyway, three days later, we were liberated. When we came into Dachau, there's a mountain full of dead bodies. As far as your eye can see, there were dead bodies. They were next to the crematorium, and uh, I guess they, they ran out of coal, so they couldn't burn them, and they were piling up, and they put us, this is the train that I came with, the dead train, and they put us uh, in a barrack right next to the crematorium. They didn't give us a bunk, we just laid on the ground, and three days later, up you hear, Bafrayung, Bafrayung, liberation, Americans, Americans. And I tell my cousin, let's go out and see what's going on. And we went out and we see, we see uh, inmates were crawling on their hands and knees, and they were kissing the boots of the GIs, American GIs. They looked like angels to us. They came. We couldn't believe it. They, they looked like gods. Um, and, and we stand inside the yard and two uh, GIs walk up to me. They had a can of Spam. They opened it up and it smelled so good. We made a mistake. We ate a little. We shouldn't have eaten it. Our stomachs are not used to it. And both of us came down with desenteria. My cousin dies in my arm the night after liberation, the night of liberation, he dies in my arm from dysenteria. And I was so sick. So when they came and they took him away, I followed. And as I followed, my knees gave out from under me and I fell. When I fell, they pushed me to a wall and I was there a few hours. Then a man came up to me, dressed, nicely dressed with a suit. And he asked my name. I introduced myself and he says, he is a Jesuit priest. He talked to me in Polish. He's a Jesuit priest. He came with nuns and doctors from France and they're opening up a field hospital in Dachau. And he's gonna take me to this field hospital. And he puts me on top of his shoulder. I weighed about 60 pounds. I was 16 years old and maybe 60 or 55 pounds. Like a bag of bones, he takes me. And he talked to me, he told me something I'll never forget. He says, Benek, he says, talks to me in Polish. You went through something awful. All, all that, what they did to the Jewish people is unbelievable. And the only sin that you did is that you were born to a Jewish parent. Because of that, they killed all of you. He says, however, don't you ever abandon your noble religion. To hear that from a Jesuit priest in 1945 was very unusual. You may hear that today, but not then. And he took me into the um, um, hospital or dormitory, whatever, and they had, the, they had um, cuts, with white sheets on it, they put me on a cot, and none came over, took my vitals, and I passed out. Two months later, I woke up in Santo Tillian. This is a monastery in Bavaria, not far from Munich, 
and the monks gave up one building to make a hospital for the survivors. And this is where I came to life two months after liberation. I didn't know anything. I wake up. And my story continues. Uh, it, it's what happened to me afterwards and how I found my sister. And it, it's going to take too long to tell you the story. I could only tell you that it's all in this book. The book is called Living a Life That Matters from Nazi Nightmare to American Dream. My dear friends, you're youngsters. You have a whole future in front of you. I'll tell you something. Hitler, Hitler and the Nazis did not start with killing. It all started with hate. Hate, propaganda, and this is how it began. So the hatred has to stop. The Nazis uh, had hate. And because if you hate someone, it's easy to kill. If you bully someone in school, that person that you bullied is never going to forget. He's always going to hate you for it. Do you want to grow up and graduate from school and have enemies? You don't want to do that because you never know what this person can do to you. If you hate bad enough, it's easy to kill. So hatred has to stop. You have to stop that. When you go home tonight or this evening or after school, hug and kiss your parents. Appreciate them. Don't take them for granted. Know that you're loving, they're loving you and you should love them. What can I tell you? If you have any questions, and if there is time, certainly you can. Um, my story will continue for another hour, and I'm getting a message here that I only have another five or 10 minutes. So I'm gonna cut it off, but if you have any questions at all, this is my family today. Despite Hitler, I was able, that's me and my dear wife, Jean, and that's, uh, Gail, of course, my daughter, my other daughter, and her husband, and, her, and my great-grandchildren. This picture was taken in Hawaii. So, despite Hitler, we are a family. That's the family of my sister's family. This is her son and her daughter, and from that family, all of these. So, again, my sister survived the Holocaust and I, only two of us from a family of seven. Any questions, I will gladly answer them. We have um, one, uh, we, we have a couple of questions that have been typed through. And again, um, Mark, uh, Ludwig, Johannes, um, anybody has questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, but the first question is, uh, first of all, they all wanna thank you so much for this opportunity to hear from you. Um, they wanted to know what has helped you being able to overcome living through all of these horrible experiences. I ask myself the same question. I, I don't know, but my, the only answer I have is that God needed a witness. He needed someone to tell the world what happened. And not most of us survivors can't talk about it. It hurts too much and it brings back too many bad memories. And, and it, it's very difficult. 
it hurts me too, and I have sleepless nights too. But someone has to do it, and I devoted my life to that. And I started a foundation called the Zahor. Zahor, those little pins mean Zahor means remember. Remember the Holocaust. And we have so many things that we do. We, we yeah. Can, yeah. Before we go into about Zahor, um, I'd like to let the students know that, you know, remember I'm Ben's daughter and I remember him waking up through the night at nights with having nightmares and screaming in the middle of the night or seeing uh, when I was young, seeing some scars on his back. But one of the things that I do want to let you know is that my father has made sure, one of, one of the things that I asked him early on I said, how, how did you survive all this? And his answer to me was that my main question was, did you ever think you were going to die? And he said that we were too busy trying to live, you know, from moment to moment. So it wasn't about that they were thinking that they're going, oh no, they're going to die, they're going to die, they're going to die. It's what they need to do to live. And that I, to me, that was a very powerful lesson that I learned, just hearing that statement from him. So we have um, another question that came through. They wanna know, um, how does Ben see Germany today? Do you have any animosity or um, do you have any views as far as like with your experiences and memories uh, with Germany in the past? No, I, um, I spoke in, in many uh, schools in, in Germany and I always tell the youngsters, I have absolutely nothing against you uh, for, for the sins that your great, great grandfathers did or grandfathers. Each person is a person on their own. And I respect each one of you. Uh, it doesn't make a difference to me if you're German or if you're Polish or if you're Jewish or if you're Israeli. You are a human being. You know, Hitler, um, Hitler foresaw a... Um, Übermenschen, you know what Übermenschen is, superior type of people. This is what he envisioned. Now, he envisioned mostly the Nordic type, um, blonde hair, blue eyes. Now, he didn't even qualify for that, but this was his envision. Now, imagine a world of course, you also had to be a Nazi. If you were not a Nazi, you had no right to live. So he envisioned blonde hair, blue eyes, Nazis, that kind of a world he wanted. Imagine a world where everybody looks the same, everybody thinks the same Nazism, what kind of a world it would be like a bunch of ants following a leader. The beauty in this world is that we are different. We look different. We think differently. This is what makes this world beautiful. So I want you to know I have absolutely no animosity against German or Polish or Jewish uh, for the only time I would hate say that I hate someone is if I see someone who is harming somebody else. We are all should respect each other and get along with each other. Let's live side by side and appreciate our differences rather than hate them. Why hate? You see what comes out of hate. If you hate, it's so easy to become a killer 
after hating. So the hatred and the bullying in school has to stop. Absolutely. There were, um, the kids want to know if uh, there were any Germans that helped you along the way in, in your story. Yes. There was a, uh, a, um, the head of the Gestapo from Bochnia, from that ghetto, the head of that Gestapo saved our lives. I didn't tell you the story because it was too long of a story how we got out of the ghetto. But the head of the Gestapo, his name was Schon Schoenberg. Or Sch yeah, Schoenberg, I believe was his name. He helped us to get out of the ghetto. Eventually, he was shot by the Nazis. They found out what he did, and he paid with his life. But there are some people like me who are alive today because of what this head of the Gestapo did. This is a story in itself, and you have to read it in my book. It's all described what he did. And we'll send out the link to all the uh, teachers that are participating today for um, your book. But definitely check out ZahorFoundation.org. I'll put the link out in the chat. Um, the kids wanted to know, um, what was your psychological condition when you were first leaving the camp? When, I'm, when I was first leaving? Camp. When you first left Dachau, like what was going through your mind? Okay. When I left Dachau, I was out of, uh, I was in coma. So I couldn't, I couldn't think because I was in coma at that time. I don't know what my, what I felt. I woke up two um, months later. I can tell you what happened after two months. What ben, I, yeah. why don't you tell them real quick about how at San Cecilia and how you were able to recover and how the miracle of finding your sister. Okay, if I have the time. Um, when I woke up in Santa Tillion, a nun, a nurse came back to me, came up to me uh, after, after a day or two, I don't remember, one or two days later, and she said, Mr. Lesser, I have a favor to ask of you. What is it? We're running short of beds. We don't have enough beds for all our uh, sick people. Would you mind if I put a young man in your bed, head to toe. He's a young man about your age, and he is also a Holocaust survivor from Dachau. Uh, I said, no, I don't mind it at all. And so what happened is this young man was brought to me, and he and I became very good friends, and we became like surrogate brothers because he lost his family, and as far as I knew, I lost my family. So we became like surrogate brothers. And we joined an organization of Chalutzim, an organization of pioneers who wanted to go to Palestine because we felt that if we were in, if we had our own country, this, the, the Holocaust would have never happened. Our own, we had our own country. Um, uh, the, 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 we would have, the, 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 we couldn't, it couldn't happen because we wouldn't allow it to happen. Only because we had no place to go and we were strangers in all these lands where we picked out to be uh, killed and persecuted. So I became a member of this group. And one day they picked 10 of us, 
to go to Palestine at that time. This was, and if the British found out about it, they would put us in, in, in jail because the, the um, Arabs didn't want Jewish people coming to Palestine at the time. Okay, so this was in 1945, we joined, and I was picked to go to Palestine underground to keep it, uh, because the British shouldn't find out. And we, 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 we left. But as we left, one young lady um, that was picked to go to Palestine got sick. And they took her, her name is Rachel, they took her to a hospital to Santa Tillian. And before I left for the group, I said, I have to go say goodbye to her and make sure that she knows when, when she gets better, we will come and bring her over. So I went there and I sat on her bed talking to her and I had to wait there two hours for a bus to come to pick me up. So while I am on her bed talking to her, I am not paying attention to the other women in the same hospital room. But there was a woman next to her and she paid attention to me. And when I left, she says, Rachel, who was this young man with his wavy black hair he reminds me so much of my brothers. Oh, his name is Benjamin. See, we, we went by our Hebrew name, Benjamin. Benjamin, I had a brother by the name of Ben, a Benek, Beinish. Do you happen to have a picture of them? She says, yes, we have a picture of, and she showed her this picture. And this woman looks at this, Young man, she screams, that's my brother, my brother, he's alive, he's alive. Imagine, he said he was here two hours and he left. Now I left and I went underground because um, we were in Frankfurt. And um, the only thing Rachel knew is that I went to Frankfurt and from Frankfurt, we were going to Marseille to board the ship. So but it was hushed up on the underground. So my sister finds a cousin and she swears on his head, says, go find my brother and don't come back without him. Tell him that his sister Lola is in a hospital dying and her dying wishes to see her brother. Now she wasn't dying, but she told him to say that. and. He went to, he went to um, um, uh, Frankfurt. What? Frankfurt, thank you. He went to Frankfurt and he walks the street up and down. He doesn't know where to go. One hour, two hours. Finally, he sees a bunch of young people speaking Yiddish. So he walks up to them. Do you happen to know Ben Lesser? Uh, they knew me, but they were afraid to tell him because we were underground. Uh, so he says, look, he has a sister who is dying in the hospital. Her last wish is to see her brother. If you know him, and they felt sorry, they took, took him to me. And he tells, comes over and tells me, uh, the good news first that my sister is alive. She's in the hospital. And then he tells me that she's dying and her dying wishes to see me. So I had to leave this group. And when I left um, this group, my friend um, is right here. Moishe. Moishe is my friend. He's the one who stayed in the same room with me in bed. We shared the bed in Santa Tillian. We were like brothers. And I told him, look, my sister is alive, but she's dying in a hospital. I'm going to leave. The next morning, we were supposed to go to Marseille. When he hears that, he turns around and he walks away from me. And I never saw him again. So it bothered me. 
I never saw him again for 70 years. But I went back to my sister and I come to my sister. Rachel is still in bed. And the next to her bed is my sister Lola. And I see she we are embracing and she is pregnant. I says, Lola, are you pregnant? She says, yes, I'm expecting a child any day. I'm in ninth month. And it turned out I'm not sick. I just used that to get you back here. Um, that's the only way she could have gotten me back by saying she's dying. So I went back and we went back and then a month later she had the baby, um, Heshi, and that's her husband, that's a nurse, and that's me. Um, and my whole life changed. Instead of going to Palestine, uh, I would have gone to Palestine. I would have probably been a soldier there fighting for our land to become Israel. But I, I went to America instead and I married and uh, I, I'm married now for uh, 70 years that I just had our 70th anniversary. Um, and we have two daughters and we have uh, four grandchildren and five great grandchildren. Um, things are going pretty good. Any other questions? Um, we'll go with a couple more questions. There, there were a number of questions that the kids wanted to know about hope. Um, first of all, what they want to know what gave you hope while you were in the camp, and then they wanted to know if you ever lost hope while you were in the camp. The answer to that is no. I didn't lose hope. After I went through that beating, um, when I got those 25 lashes, that was the time that I felt it's possible that I may not get through, I'll be shot. So I was prepared, but somehow or another, in the back of my mind, I always had hope that I will survive it. And I did survive it. I, but afterwards, um, yes, I, I always had hope. I, I dragged my cousin along who was sick and I tried to keep him alive. I felt that I'm young enough and if I made it so far, I should be able to make it all the way. But I, I really don't remember, to tell you the truth, how I felt. Um, because afterwards, I, I went into coma. And after I went into coma, I don't know how I felt before. All I know is in the train, I was pretty and the, I was pretty uh, close to dying. And I see everybody around me is dead, um, but we're still alive. I think that one breath that I took for somehow saved me. But imagine with all that bleeding and all that filth and dirt without, without any water, um, we had, the train bus stopped a few times and they allowed us to get some snow. So we, we filled out, we had two empty buckets, we filled it with snow and everyone was using that. But that only happened two or three times in three weeks. So, um, we'll, we'll go with uh, maybe like two more questions. Um, and so, the kids wanted to know when was the first time that you talked about your story um, with others? Okay. I didn't want to tell my kids anything that my, that I was, they knew that I was a survivor, but I didn't want to tell them the story. I wanted them to grow up like American kids mingling with other nationalities, having many friends. 
I didn't want them to feel that they were different. But when my grandson, who was in fifth grade, calls me up one day and says, uh, Papa, he says, my teacher found out that you are a Holocaust survivor. Would you mind coming to our class and tell your story? I have never done this, but my grandson is asking me, so how can I deny him? So I remember going to that school and I went to the door as I were about to, it just like opening a door to a uh, principal's office. I, I felt so strange. What am I going to tell fifth graders? How can I tell them these stories? They go home and they'll have nightmares. But when I came in, they gave me from 10 to 11 to speak. And I spoke from 10 to 11, from 11 to 12. They didn't stop and the kids were all glued to their chairs with their mouths open and their eyes on me. So after two hours, the school bell rang. It was 12 o'clock for lunch. They didn't budge. They didn't want to get up. The teacher chased them out to go eat lunch. Instead of eating lunch, they surrounded me in the hallway with questions. They wanted to touch me, ask questions. And you know, that's when I realized, Ben, you cannot keep silent. The world has to know. And this is about the time when I moved to Las Vegas. I retired um, from, from my business and um, I, I volunteered to be a speaker and I started to speak from that point on. This is about 25 years that I have kept speaking. And I wrote a book. And besides writing the book, I wrote a curriculum book that's now in all the schools. Um, you can get to it on our foundation, Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation. My daughter, Gail, will give you all the information, www.zahorlearn.org Zahorlearn is, um, is my curriculum book. Um, you'll love it, you'll love it. And it's free of charge. We, we, we just want people to, to learn, to remember the Holocaust. We keep this world from acquiring amnesia we cannot allow the world to forget about it because it shows you what hatred can bring. And this is exactly what happened. There's a big lesson for the world to learn. Stop the hatred, stop the hatred. We all have a right, the same right to live. It doesn't matter what nationality you are, what color you are, we're all God's creations. We have to learn to live side by side and appreciate our differences. Well, that kind of touches on the very final question and, and that was um, the students wanted to know how can we prevent another Holocaust from happening? I would love to answer that. Oh, wait, okay. Ben, you answer that first and then I'm gonna follow up. Okay. Again, hatred has to stop. We have to stop. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're white or black. It doesn't matter what your religion is. You're a human being. You have to respect each other. Live side by side and appreciate us. Don't, there's so much we can learn from each other. But we're all on this earth together. It doesn't matter. And it's beautiful that we look different, we think differently. If we would all be the same, we would be like a bunch of ants. I told you that earlier. Gail, you tell the difference. Well, I'm just going to introduce you and to the teachers, which I would love to see if you could help us out. We have a section on our website called ishoutout.org. And this is a movement that we're trying to get interaction, especially from students, anybody. But 
if we pass the word against anti-Semitism, uh, for freedom, against bullying, uh, for equality, we just, the more positive that we are, the more positive words that come out of our mouth to somebody else's ears and it passes, it passes forward, uh, that's what we need in this world. We need to be able to live together and to enjoy and to learn from each other. So what we're asking you to do is to go to ishoutout.org and if you sign up there, it's free, everything's free. We don't share your email address with anybody, but if you put in what you shout out for, you could shout out for all of them or just one or two. Your shout out is going to be online forever. As long as the computer systems are working, we are going to make sure that um, Zahor lives on to be able to teach future generations. And just imagine your grandchildren or your great grandchildren could look your name up one day, see a picture of you today and see that you shouted out for equality or uh, against bigotry or something like that. That's what's gonna help pass the word on every positive thing that we do to our, that we say or do to our neighbor is going to make this world a more, um, just a, a little bit more of a brighter, more beautiful place. Put that smile on your face and pay it forward. Yes, so, Ben, is there anything else you wanna um, impart on the students before um, we, we say goodbye? Yes, I, I just want to say this. Uh, while individuals can't always choose what happens to them, whether it's a crisis or a calamity, people can choose to either let it ruin their lives or to learn from it and move forward. It's essential to understand the consequences of personal choices it's possible to let tragedy or trauma become a reason to stop living. But it's also possible to live through extreme circumstances and commit to a life that has meaning, a life that matters. I want you to remember that. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to so many kids. And uh, I know that our friends in Germany um, appreciate it. And we'll be sure to send you those links and those websites. Uh, we want to say Auf Wiedersehen, Dankeschön, and Haben Sie einen guten Tag. So thank you guys. We appreciate you. And uh, we look forward to staying in touch. Bye. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Auf Wiedersehen.